In an industry stuffed with marketing bullshit, empty promises, and shiny suited liars, one woman's had enough. She knows what it's like to have the wrong clients, no money, and no time for fun. But she also knows how to fix it. And on the Business for Superheroes show, she promises to tell the down and dirty truth about business, sales, and running away with the circus. Here's your host, Vicki Fraser. to the Business to Superhero Show. I'm Vicky Fraser and this is my second attempt and I'll tell you all about it next week. And uh, this week I'm here with Peter Thompson, who is my first mentor. Um, Peter has been a business... Hi, man. Vicky. Hi, Peter. Thank you so much for being here. I really, really appreciate it. <laughs> um, Peter has been a businessman and an entrepreneur for more years than he'd probably like me to mention. And today he's going to talk about how he got started and how he's built this amazing lifestyle that he has. So hi, Peter. Thank you so much for joining us and thank you for being here. Now, it's my pleasure, Vicky. Lovely to speak to you again. Thank you very much indeed for inviting me. You are more than welcome. Um, okay, so I would like to start right at the beginning, if that's all right, um, with one of my favourite Peter stories about you, and that is your tale of disaster and woe. So will you tell us, will you tell my listeners about your beautiful house and why you had to leave it behind and what happened? Yes, I will. Um, I started in business a long time ago. In fact, it was 45 years ago, and I'd had a number of businesses. I was a private detective. I was, had a tracing agency where we used to trace absconded debtors. And we were tracing 4,000 people a month, would you believe? Wow. The biggest trace agency in <laughs> Europe. And that led me into bugging and debugging. And that led me into car telephones in the very early days of Press to Speak, Release to Listen, when I would make £1,000 per phone on lease. Nice. And I would sell, which was lovely. And I would sell one a day. Apart from my sales team, I'd sell one a day myself just to get my hand in. <laughs> and uh, I realized that because of the power of leasing, that I really ought to start a leasing business. So way back in 1984, I started a leasing business. And five years later, I built it up. We were turning just shy of four million a year in fees. And I sold it to a public company for 4.2 million, uh, for a million in cash and 3.2 million in shares, which the shares were supposed to double in price over the next two years. Unfortunately, they didn't. They went the other way. And instead of doubling in price, they fell from £2.42 to 16p while I was under a restrictive covenant in the first year. And I couldn't sell the darn things. But it cost me cost me three million quid ouch Uh, ouch (laughs) so this house i had which was called avonside it's 30 acres the river avon ran through it and vicky if i had a pound for every photograph that was taken of my house from the river on passing boats i would still live there today (laughs) that's how beautiful it was it was absolutely gorgeous it was a seven bedroom ivy covered mansion and anyway fortunately we had a house in devon um, which was a little holiday home, a little bungalow. And I, we had all the seven-bedroom house packed into boxes. And we moved to Devon. And the front of the house in Devon was totally glass, looking out over the sea. And we stacked all the boxes in front of the window. And I said to Sharon, my wife, we will never see that view again until we get this sorted. Nice. And I decided to get off my rear end. After all, it was only like a footballer being tripped over and having a damp sponge down his underpants. <laughs> I thought, come on, please, we don't need any of that stuff. Let's get back to it. And so I drove away from Avonside with my dog, Mike, and my four-track recorder in the car. And I moved the mirror so I couldn't look back. So that focused me that there was only one way, and that was to look forward. So that was basically the story. Oh, that's that's that is such a fantastic story because it's like a it's a proper kind of ra- well not rags but a proper kind of rags to riches and then and then like desperation and oh and I'm not gonna you know I'm not gonna look back and I'm not gonna I'm gonna damn well make this work and I love the fact that you didn't look back as well I think that's a really important lesson. Yeah, it was. It's true. It's absolutely. I moved the mirror so I couldn't because I didn't want to see that house in my rear view mirror as I drove away. <laughs> I wanted to focus on the journey I was going to take from that point onwards. You know, I think, I think it's Nigel Risner who says you should treat the past as a library where you go for reference and not somewhere where you live. Yes, absolutely. Because we, t- we have a tendency as humans to focus on the mistakes of the past. And uh, as long as you learn from them and move on and don't make the same mistakes again, you just treat them as lessons. We are not our mistakes. And, you know, you can't hang on to I can't hang on to that shit because it'll drag you down. It really will. And it's, it's true. My, my friend Ted Nicholas taught me a word. You know the word. We've used it together um, at the end of a phrase, but it's just on its own. Next. Next. <laughs> yes. <laughs> 
<laughs> yes, what's next? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So, okay, so after yeah. when you were when you were in your house in Devon with your blocked up view and and your you know right, I'm going to make this work again. What what did you do? How did you make your your first million after it all fell apart? Ah, marketing. <laughs> Just marketing. I know that the success for business is sales and marketing. You know, you know, I've always looked at businesses having three areas: there's marketing, there's making, and there's measuring. Somebody's going to make something somehow, even if it's a product or service. Somebody's got to sales and marketing it, and somebody's got to measure. Right? So as long as you've got something happening in all those three areas, you probably get it, most of it cracked. So I knew that the success was going to be sales and marketing. So I recorded a little cassette on my four-track cassette recorder in my garage with the seagulls in the background, right, with a story called Once Upon a Time, There Were Two Frogs, and it was me selling my services to come and train people, salespeople. And I, I bought, no, I rented 2,000 names. And like all good marketers, I split it in half and did a test. And I sent 1,000 of those people a copy of the cassette with a letter. And the other 1,000, I sent a letter saying, ask for the cassette. Okay. And I got 1.1% 1, 1. 1 response from the people who I said, ask for it. No, 36 from the people who asked and 1.1% from the people I sent it to. But I made it really difficult. I didn't follow up. They had to follow me up. Because okay. what I was trying to do was to suppress response so that the people who contacted me were obviously keen enough. They probably listened. They'd at least got used to my voice slightly. They probably laughed at the story, which is a cracking story anyway. And if you want me to tell it later, I will. Yes, please. And, and it was one I lived my life by, by the way, as well. And, uh, and it just worked brilliantly. And then because I'm referral crazy, I have a systemized referral process in my business. Then I just got a few clients to start with and just leveraged it, use the American version of that, leveraged it using referrals and just built the business from there. Just marketing, 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 marketing. Cool. That's it. So, okay. So that's, that's given me a little jump off. Can you tell us about your systemized referral process? Cause I think that that's probably, I mean, all of my best clients and my private clients, um, all, all of them have come from referrals or from networking or from, you know, pe from, from the people that I know. So can you tell us a bit about how you used your referral system to. Yeah, indeed. indeed. Yeah. So what I would, this was my golden rule It's slightly different from a lot of people's way of doing it. My golden rule of asking for referrals is I will ask when someone happy okay right so they could be happy on the first meeting so you could meet somebody and you know yourself Vicky, you meet somebody in life and you just get on like you were lost souls you know and yeah. you resonate you laugh you have, you have a good time the meeting that we scheduled for 20 minutes is three hours um and you obviously you're going to do business together now you wouldn't miss that opportunity to ask for referrals even though you've done nothing for them they they've got enough rapport with you they like you enough to refer you Normally, of course, the, the system would kick in once the training had happened and I'd done some work with somebody. They'd had my Action is the Key audio program for every salesperson because I insisted on that because of what's called the Ebbinghaus effect and the way people forget information. Yeah. And so then I would go back to that person and I had a script that I'd created where I would ask for referrals. And if I was chatting to you, let's say you were a sales director, I would say, oh, Vicky, I suppose over the, the years you've met a number of other sales directors, haven't you? And you'd well, go, yeah, yes, I yeah. <laughs> and, I, and I'd say, well, which of the ones you're thinking of, because you wouldn't be thinking of them by then, which of the ones you're thinking of do you think could benefit from my services in the same way that you have and that you've been making so much money out of it? Who do you think would be first? I should, you know, and I had this basic process of a script I would go through um, and people would love it and say, can you teach it myself, people, to do that, please? Yeah. Huh? So it would, it would trigger at the point someone was happy. Worst case scenario, I'd done the training. They were making more money. Salespeople liked me enough, um, although I was a bit firm with them. And that's the way well, it worked. So the systemized referral process. Cool. And uh, one, of, one of the lessons to come out of that, I think, is, is just ask. Because if you don't ask, you don't get. And, and people, don't, you know, people don't mind being asked if they're happy with you. It's like, it's like you say, ask, ask them. Yeah, when they're... <clears throat> yeah. My version is if you don't ask, they can't say yes. Well, yeah. Oh, yeah. That's yeah. That's even better if you don't ask. They can't say yes. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Okay. So, um, one of one of the things that I think would be really useful to talk about because you're kind of you're you know you you've built up businesses 
into million pound businesses and you know multi-million pound businesses as, as we've seen we only see the tip of the iceberg of of most people we don't see what goes on in the background and i think quite a lot of small business owners get disillusioned and frightened by looking at people like the, the you know the richard bransons and the gary v's of the world and they see them up on their pedestals and they see all of this stuff that they've achieved and they don't see that the hard work that goes into the background so can you tell us a little bit about your early days and how you focused how you decided what the right thing to focus on and you know how you organized your time and you know a little bit about how the, the hard work the grunt work the non-sexy work that goes on in the background and underneath the tip of the iceberg i understand yes great question vicky great question um the way that I come at it is this. I'm very fortunate, I feel, to be very task-oriented. or oriented. Um, If you looked at my um, disk profile, you know, I'm high DI. Uh, you know, uh, so you, uh, you understand what that means. So I'm high DI. So I'm very, very task-oriented. So for me, to have systems that I stick to is easy. So all of my life, I would say, from when I was uh, started Compass Leasing, I've always used a do list of some description. I've called it to do, I've called it a do, and I've called it an action plan. And these days I have it um, obviously, you know, in the cloud. So it links and syncs across my phone and my iPad and my Mac and everything else. It's always with me. So I'm, I'm very focused on that. I have a one to 31 file where everything is diary. So I've always got the paperwork for whatever day of the week or the month or the year. It's always just a simple system. I do I journal every morning and every evening. And when I say every, I mean every without fail, right? Um, I read every day, every single day. I read my purpose every single day. So I'm a weirdo when it comes to stuff like this because I know success is created out of small steps. Yeah. And I learned this from Earl Nightingale on Lead the Field, which was the first audio program I ever listened to. I received a mailer from Nightingale Kermit. I thought, I'll send for this. There's no risk. I'll have a go at it. I listened to it, and it changed my life. Um, I, later on, I even approached Nightingale Kermit, and I did a UK version. So there's a UK version of Lead the Field with me saying it. Um, you know, talk about being asked to rewrite the Bible. And Earl Nightingale <laughs> said in there, and I always remember, he said, and I can almost hear him say Peter, even though he didn't say it. Um, the Peter, and a successful life is built of successful years, which is built of successful months, which is built of successful weeks, which is built of successful days, which are built of a double prioritized do list. Yeah. And unless you're double prioritizing your tasks so that you're constantly focusing on the highest priority task all day long, you will get distracted. So my do list, and doesn't mean I don't get distracted, by the way. I'm not a paragon of virtue here, just so we realize, right? But I, I'm pretty focused on task. So I set tasks to do, and I damn well do them because I've made that promise to myself. I remember listening to a guy called Bill Bartman, who owns the Chicago Bulls. He's worth about half a billion dollars, and his wife's also worth the other half a billion. And he says, don't set goals. Make promises. People are very good at keeping promises. They're crap. It's going to stick into goals. That's really good advice, actually. And that, I think, um, I had an idea of what I wanted people to take away from, from this podcast. And I still kind of I still kind of want them to do that. But actually, I think what you've just said there is, is so important. And it's something that I've been reminded of is, like, what's your mission in life? And I'm not talking about, like, a massive mission like Bill Gates is, is on a mission to kind of eradicate malaria from the world. I'm talking about your personal mission. And you've obviously kept your personal mission right front and center of everything that you've done for your whole life, which is, you know, how you've got to yeah. where you are. So I think that, you know, that message is so important. It's like, what's your, what's your personal mission? And is, are your actions today going to take you towards it? And if they're not, why are you doing them? Yeah. And if you start the day by reading your purpose, and I, I start my day because it's on my do list. <laughs> surprise, surprise. Um, my, my writing my journal is on my do list. Reading my mind changer cards is on my do list. You know, everything's on my do list because then I just tick it off. It's, yeah. it's that easy. So I read the purpose at the start of every day. So that's my guiding light. That's my lodestone. That, you know, that is the day's focus. That's who I am. That's what I do. And so therefore, the tasks match the purpose there. Forgive the pun, Vicky. They're on purpose. Yeah. That's awesome. That's such an awesome way to, to do things because it just keeps you, it keeps you focused on your task. And, you know, it, it's just every day there it is in front of you. And, you know, that's, that's something that I've been doing for a couple of years now. And it, it really does make a, a really big difference. Um, yeah. But I think you've learned as well as I have, because we've talked about it, it gives you flexibility. People think it gives you rigidity. Mm. No, it gives you rigidity where you need rigidity, which is get on with it. 
right? But it gives you flexibility because you can do that and you can schedule time off. I schedule walking every day. Yeah, absolutely. So we can, and I know that also you plan your years in advance, don't you? You plan your plan your work around your holiday time, don't you? Yes, absolutely. This this year, um, if you want, I'll very quickly share it. We have a yeah. spreadsheet, Sharon and I. So people are going, "You sad person!" Right? <laughs> <laughs> well, if they're saying that, I'm going to point out to them that this sad person has built million pound businesses and is living a beautiful life. So you know, <laughs> he's the. <laughs> <laughs> um, we sat down and we asked ourselves the question. Uh, we did this individually, by the way, which I think couples should do. Where do you want to go in the world? Where's the holidays? Right? And so we both wrote them down and we came together and compared them. And then we created a spreadsheet. I did the typing stuff. I didn't do that bit. And down the left-hand side, we put all the places in the world we want to go. And then across the top, we put all the months of the year. And then we went online and we did this search, best time to go to. And we put the names of the places in. And we did all these searches and we filled in and coloured in the meeting square of the best months to go to those places. And now all we're doing is we're working through the spreadsheet. So, <laughs> <laughs> so in, in May, we're going to Moscow um, wow. for four days, and then we're taking a river cruise back for eight days to St. Petersburg and flying home from there. Because um, the, we have a holiday at home in Spain, we're going to Spain for three months in the middle of the year, and then at the end of the year, we're scheduled to go to New York. Love. Now, the New York one isn't booked, but all the others are booked and paid, and the flights and car, uh, whatever it all sorted, is booked. Because when it's booked, you're committed. Yes. <laughs> so, <laughs> then all we do is we just uh, make the business work around that schedule. Yeah, and that that's the ideal place to be, really, isn't it? It's it's not so much it's not so much the the money you make; it's what the money allows you to do, and the money allows you to live this lifestyle of you know going on holiday whenever the hell you want, and you know helping the people that you help on a schedule that suits you. And that's I think that really is most people's ideal is is being able to do the things that they want to do. It's it's like you said, the money is just mm. kind of keeping score, really. It is. Well, the the more time off you take, the more money you tend to make. See, because that's, you come at it always fresh. Yeah, that, that's a counterintuitive idea. But yeah, do you want, could you explain that a little bit more? Well, yeah, because if you and I, you know, because I'm task orientated, you can get very task doing. You know, you know, they say if you want to get something done, give it a busy person. Yeah, because busy, busy people do they can fit it in because they're good at getting stuff done and they love doing it, so they make everything into a task, which is what I do. Right, because I love tasks, so I just do them. Right, and if you're not careful, you can just be doing it, doing it, doing it, doing it, as Michael Gerber would say, all day long, every day. So if I don't schedule in the timing, right, then it doesn't work. But what I've found over life is this: is the more time I take away from the business and get some clarity in my head, when I come back to the business, I come back with amazing ideas and I make more money. Yeah. Whereas if I'm just in the grind of it all day long, I get caught in the grind of it. And therefore, you know, I've just got to lift myself out. That's why I go walking. I won't say every day, but almost every day. Even if it's 10 minutes around the block or it's down to the local park, which I'd love to go to, Jefferson Gardens in Leamington. And I go walk around there and look at the trees and the ducks and it's crazy. And my head's just ticking away or Sharon and I are chatting away, you know. Um, it's, it's taking that break from it. And I, because if anyone who's your task orientator will understand this, Vicky, and I'm sure you are as well at times, is you have to drag yourself away because yeah. the business is not work. It's fun. Yeah. Or <laughs> it should people be. Say to my wife, because it should. People say to Sharon, when's Peter going to retire? She said, you don't understand. This is him retired. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it's, it's funny too, though, and that actually that kind of brings me on to something I was I was going to ask you about the the importance of you obviously love what you do, and I see people kind of struggling along with with things that they don't really seem to be passionate about. I hate this like overused word passion, but I think actually you do need to love what you do. What do yeah. you think about that? Yeah, I, I think you do. I, I, I think it's back to this lovely report which um, your, your listeners could download, and it's called The Common Denominator of Success. Okay. And it's by Al Albert E. N. Gray. Albert E. N. Gray, The Common Denominator of Success. And it's only about four pages of A4, so it's well worth a read. And I'll give you a pricey very quickly. He says this, and it's back from 1920s or something. He says... 
successful people focus on pleasing outcomes. Failures focus on pleasing actions. So what I've learned to do in life is I do what I love to do and I'm quite prepared to do what needs to be done. Right. And that's the difference. And so, yes, love what you do. And then occasionally the stuff that's got to be done, will just damn well do it. And then I've found if you do it often enough, you actually get to love it anyway. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, actually, that's that's a really good way of, of thinking about the things that you have to do. Because I was talking about um, last week's podcast was all about procrastination. And, and part of the reason that we procrastinate is because our brains are wired for immediate gratification, instant gratification. And your yep. future self is, you know, all of that future reward, your present self doesn't care about that because it, it's difficult for it to, to grasp it. So the way you've yeah. built your life and business seems to work great because it's like, okay, so you're always focused on the, the future results, but you're making sure that what you do now is something that you love so that you can be motivated to do the things that you know you need to do to, to get to that future that's, that's a really cool place. that's right you know yeah I, I like the dopamine as much as anybody else does you know that's why and a lot of my modern programs now are being built in with gratification built with gamification being built in there so yeah. you, you you watch the video you get a tick Yes. So, you know, the screen goes click and you go, wow, I think I'll watch another one. You know, so this is the way that we're getting people to to learn more because we're giving them a return on their investment in the learning, not just a return on their investment financially. Exactly. So they're getting an emotional return on their investment. That, by the way, listeners, that is a little gem that Peter has just snuck in there that you would do very well to listen to again and use. Because if you can understand what makes people tick and, and why, you know, how to get them to do stuff and how to get them to consume what you're giving them, that's that's gold because they, they will come back for more. So pay close attention to that and, and you know, see where you can build that in. <clears throat> so, OK, I have yeah. one more question for you, Peter, if that's OK. Sure. If, if you could do... Only if you could tell people, if you were only allowed to tell my listeners one single thing and you weren't allowed to tell them anything else, what would you choose to tell them that they could do to grow their business, to become successful? Okay. Uh, God, this is such a fantastic question. I have 17 answers running through my head. Um, so you, you rascal for asking it because you're forcing me to come up with one of them and I really want to tell you 17. Okay, so I, I'll pick one because I think this could really make a difference to everybody, is write a book. Now, don't get put into, you've got to write a 200 page book. You don't need to do that. Write a book that's between 60 and 80 pages. You will write it in a week. It'll only take you about 10,000 words if you put a lot of cartoons and graphics and other helpful stuff in there as well. If you feel you've got to write the whole thing, then it's only going to be about 14,000 words. And even at some slow writing speed or dictating speed, you will get that done and published inside three months maximum, and that will be if you're a slow coach. And you will have a piece of work that is the best business guide you've ever had in your life, and you will feel so proud of yourself that you will realize you can do anything. That's a really great piece of advice. And obviously I love it because I'm all about writing people's, you know, getting people to write their books. So that's really, really cool. Thank you very much. And um, finally... I thought that would resonate. Yeah, totally. <laughs> I'm always on it. People, I'm always on it, my guys, to write a book. And, and you know, so that's, that's always my thing. So finally, what are you working on at the moment? And where can people find out more about what you're doing? Well, I have started what I now call my legacy program. Sharon and I um, have set down our next 25 years um, actions. We know what we're doing. And like you, uh, we work in 90-day cycles uh, because in 25 years, there's 100 of them. So each one's worth 1%. And I learned that from Dan Sullivan, which was a great idea. And so I've, I've launched my legacy program where I'm going to put all of my material online. It's, it's starting to be populated. It's already launched just a little while ago. It's called The Achievers Club. And fortunately, I have the website, theachieversclub.com. Brilliant. And so if, anybody goes, yeah, if anybody goes to theachieversclub.com, you will find a one minute, 59 second video of me, subject to what day of the week ago, where I quickly explain it. And it's a dollar a day to access everything I've ever learned and ever will learn because I'm putting all of it in there, plus material of everybody I know who's contributing as well. So that is my legacy program to change the world for the achievers who are the people who make this planet work. That's epic. That's such a cool thing. And by the way, a dollar a day for everything in your brain is, is insane. It's like 
go go to theachieversclub.com and, and have a look at this stuff, guys, because um, without Peter, I would not be on the road that I'm on at the moment. He's, you know, finding him was one of my tipping points for, you know, going from struggling along to, to where I am now and continually growing. So go and have a look at his stuff. And, you know, he's such a, you're such a lovely guy as well. It's like, I'm so glad that, you know, that we're in each other's lives because, and it's, it's just, it's just great. That's enough. That's enough gushing and backpatting and all the rest of it. But, uh, <laughs> well, I, I, pre- I appreciate all those lovely words, and um, you are well aware of how I think about you. But I don't want to publish this. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's Peter. Thank you so much. This has been a really epic podcast, and it's you know so much, so much gold in it for everybody. Um, I'm going to have to get you back on again at some point in a few months, so you can tell the two frog story. So we'll salt that for the future. Um, <laughs> Um, I will get out there. Yeah, we'll talk about salt as well in the future. And um, yeah, thank you so much. I really appreciate it. It's been fabulous. Um, next week, Joe is back uh, with me and we shall be drinking gin and rambling about... What are we rambling about? Hang on one second. We are going to be rambling about the importance of investing in yourself, which hopefully after this uh, podcast, you guys will realise. So so thanks so much, Peter. Really appreciate it. And I will speak to you again. Loved it. Thank you for giving me the opportunity, Vicky. Always happy to do it. You're welcome. <laughs> Like what you've just heard? Tell your colleagues. Tell your friends. Send them to www.businessforsuperheroes.com slash podcast.